Robert Atkin and his family came to Queensland in 1865. In his short career as a campaigning journalist and a member of parliament, he championed the public good. Robert was born in Ireland in 1841. He married his Welsh wife and along with other members of his family, emigrated to Queensland, hoping to improve his health and to find fortune. The family barely survived a hurricane on the way here. One of his sisters died of seasickness. And so it was an incredibly hazardous journey. They landed in Brisbane in 1865 and then went to central Queensland where they tried to make a go of it on the land as farmers, but drought and depression forced them off the land. They came to Brisbane and Robert had already begun a career in politics as a reforming politician. He became a journalist and then a newspaper editor. And he was helped in that journalistic career by his wife, Mary. He gained election to parliament and campaigned along with other progressive people for a fairer distribution of wealth and political influence in Queensland. He championed new industries like cotton and sugar. He advocated new railways. He wanted a fair go for the people of North Queensland. And he campaigned against corruption and against the vested interests of what was known as the Squatocracy, a group of politicians that were backed by wealthy pastoral interests who had a disproportionate influence in politics. Robert was part of a smaller liberal group that opposed the kidnapping of South Sea Islander people who were forced into working on cane plantations. And he described the law as a form of legalised kidnapping. And so he and his colleagues wanted Queensland not to be a slave state like the southern states of the United States. He wanted Queensland to be a free democracy. Sadly, Robert's health was in decline. He soldiered on and only resigned from Parliament when he was assured that another bright, young, progressive reformist called Sam Griffith would stand for Parliament in his place. And that happened. Robert and Mary had three young children and the youngest child was very ill. And Mary made the difficult decision to take her three boys back to Wales and put them in the care of their grandparents. Then she made the hazardous return journey to Queensland, not knowing if Robert was alive or dead. She managed to return to Brisbane a number of weeks before Robert died. Robert spent a lot of his final weeks and months of his life here uh, in Sandgate, uh, convalescing under the care of friends. Uh, and he would write back to his young son, Dick, talking about how beautiful it was here and reminding Dick how, as a young boy, uh, he'd swum in the seas here and collected oysters and shells. He wrote to his son, Dick, about the importance of truth and honesty and decency. And he laid out hope that Dick might come back to Brisbane. But that wasn't to be. Robert died of tuberculosis in the arms of his widow, Mary. And shortly after his death, Mary had the difficult job of writing a letter to her young sons. And she explained to them how their father's life had been one of pain, but he'd passed into God's hands and he was no longer in pain. And she wrote a beautiful letter to these sons, explaining how everyone was so fond of their father, Robert, and that he was now in God's hands. And she also said at the end of this letter that perhaps one day when these boys were big men, they would come out to Brisbane and finish the work that Robert had only just begun. Well, you can imagine the powerful influence on a four-year-old of reading or having read to him letters from a mother about their father's passing and also the influence that must have had on young Dick who was only age four of the letters from his father impressing upon him the importance of being honest and truthful and pursuing the work that Robert had started. Dick didn't come back to Brisbane. His life took a different trajectory. 
Uh, he grew up in the loving care of his mother and grandmother in Wales. He wasn't wealthy. He won scholarships to grammar schools and then won a scholarship to Oxford University where he excelled academically. He then decided to try and become a barrister. He had no real legal connections, but he went down to London and worked hard uh, and became a barrister. Extraordinarily, he met a young woman there who was the daughter of a friend of his father's who had relocated to London and he fell in love with this young woman. She'd been born exactly 12 days earlier also at North Quay so it's an incredible romance that these two young Australians born in Brisbane 12 days apart should meet again 20 or so years later having played together and swum in these seas together and they married. Dick Atkin became a successful barrister. He became a judge, a highly regarded judge and a appeal court judge. And then he was appointed to the House of Lords and the Privy Council. So he sat at the top of the judicial structure of the whole common law world. And his judgments have a similar progressive, liberal process and value that his father's political work had. Dick Atkins judgments showed an understanding of the conditions in which ordinary people work and live. In one of his most famous judgments, it's called the Sale on the Bottle case, Donnie and Stevenson, he brilliantly wrote how a duty of care was owed by a manufacturer to a consumer to take reasonable care to guard against injury. And that judgment was the foundation stone for the modern law of negligence throughout the common law world. In that judgment, when he was posing the question, who is my neighbour, who do I owe a duty of care to, he referred to the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so the Christian values that had influenced his father, who was an Irish Protestant, similarly influenced Lord Atkin in his judgments. Over decades, as a master craftsman of law and language, Dick Atkin wrote judgments that still govern the law of Australia. He showed a deep commitment to civil liberties and the rule of law. Uh, he opposed arbitrary executive detention. In 1943, when he was aged 74 and in poor health, he accepted the nomination to be Australia's representative on the War Crimes Commission. And he advocated a new idea, crimes against humanity. He thought that there were some crimes that transcended domestic law. And it was his ideas of crimes against humanity that formed the basis for the Nuremberg trials and modern international human rights law. Lord Atkin died in his 70s uh, in 1944, but his judgments live on. Late in his life, Lord Atkin wrote his father must have been a man of extraordinary of extraordinary abilities and he pointed to the inscription on the Atkin monument here at Sandgate as evidence of that. So throughout his life Dick Atkin was influenced by the example of his father and the values that his father embodied. So although Robert Atkin's life was short and his public career was short, he died aged only 30, his influence continues both through the democracy we have here in Queensland and through the laws that his son made.